Hello and welcome to my second video on propeller aircraft engines. In the first video of uh, four weeks ago or so, we discussed uh, reciprocating piston engines, the gasoline burning spark ignition engine on the one side and the jet fuel or diesel fuel burning compression ignition engine on the other side. Um, both of these engine types are reciprocating engines with pistons moving back and forth in cylinders. And in this video, I will show you how the turboprop engine, which is not reciprocating but constantly spinning, um, is basically a stretched out diesel engine. It's a compression ignition engine, the same chemical and physical principles apply as with the reciprocating uh, diesel engine. And we're going to see how operation of the turboprop engine is actually quite similar to uh, operation of a diesel engine. All right, let's get started. So on the whiteboard, on the right side, we I, I have left the um, column from last uh, week's, what, four weeks ago video, from the last video with the compression ignition diesel engine. And on the left, I have now added the common turboprop types, um, the free turboprop and the fixed turboprop. We are going to get into uh, the difference in a little bit, but for now, let's look at the general principle of the free turboprop and compare it to the compression ignition diesel engine. So the turboprop starts by sucking in air through the um, uh, through the uh, cowling, um, symbolized here by the blue line. The blue line is the air, the green line is the fuel. So the air comes in through this duct underneath the engine, um, enters the compressor section of the engine where it um, goes through the rotating um, first the axial and then the radial compressor. Not all engines have this setup, but most turboprop engines have a single stage um, axial, or several stages axial, and then a final stage uh, radial compressor, where the air is compressed and then pushed into the um, combustion chamber where the fuel, this is where the green part comes in, where the fuel is injected, um, the fuel is injected into the hot compressed air and that starts a diffusion flame exactly as it does in the diesel engine um, and that um, flame causes um, the combustion gas to rapidly expand, expand the, the hot combustion gas goes through the turbine wheel, spins up the turbine wheel which is connected to the compressor wheels at the beginning of the engine and that air um, and that combustion gas also passes through another turbine wheel which uh, spins the uh, propeller by means of a reduction gearbox and then the exhaust goes overboard. And if we compare this to the diesel cycle in the reciprocating engine, um, you notice that the, the curve of the pressure and when fuel is injected and everything like that happens exactly the same just in one continuous process. So in the diesel engine the piston comes up compressing um, the air which is just air at this point no fuel inside compresses the air as the piston is coming up the pressure goes up um, this is exactly what happens here in the compressor section and then at some point in the process fuel is injected into the hot compressed air starting this diffusion flame. This is exactly what happens um, at top dead center in the diesel engine or as the air enters the combustion chamber in uh, the turboprop engine. And then the expansion of the combustion process drives down the piston in the diesel engine. And in the turbo engine the expansion of the combustion gases drive the turbine wheels. And then of course um, in the diesel engine the exhaust valve opens, the piston comes back up and dumps all the exhaust gases overboard. Um, and in the turboprop, well there's no exhaust valve, there's just the, the tube that goes out and the combustion gases after they have spun the turbine wheels are dumped overboard. 
So the operation of the turboprop engine actually works like the diesel engine in that with the power control you ask for a certain um, RPM in case of the free turboprop you are asking the gas generator to spin at a certain um, RPM and the fuel control unit um, is basically a governor that takes the RPM of the gas generator so of this part here this spinning part here as the input uh, goes into the fuel control unit um, you are asking for a specific RPM with your uh, power lever and the fuel control unit then dumps in more fuel or less fuel to achieve the RPM that you asked for. And at that point, we are back at how do you control a diesel engine, which works exactly the same. If you ask more power from the diesel engine, what happens is we move to the right on the mixture curve by injecting more fuel, generating a richer mixture that produces more power. At that point, the engine starts to uh, spin up, more RPM is generated, that sucks in more air. The turbocharger starts to spin up, pushing in even more air. And then the, um, we move back a little bit to the left side of the mixture curve because we are still injecting the same amount of fuel, but now we're getting in more air. And then we are back at this point where we want to be just at a higher RPM. So the power increase on the diesel engine and the um, free turbine a turbo, turboprop engine looks basically the same in that we inject more fuel, we move to the right on the mixture curve, and then as we come up the power, we move back to the um, more efficient range of the mixture curve where we want to be. And in fact, you can see this on the EGT gauge of a turboprop engine. If you ask it for more power, the EGT will come up as we dump more fuel into the process and move to the right in this mixture diagram. And then the turbine spins up, sucks in more air, and then the air-fuel mixture goes back here because we're sucking in more air, and the EGT comes back down again. So the EGT is not so much a measurement of how much power we are generating. That, of course, more power produces more EGT. That is true. But the EGT is also an indication of how rich we are in the mixture diagram. So the EGT moves up more when we're asking for more power and then comes a little bit down again as we achieve the power setting. So, and all this is done by the fuel control unit. You don't really need to think about it. This is what the black power lever does. It is a set point for the governor of the gas generator. That's how it works in a PT6 engine. Then on some airplanes with PT6 engines, you see that the um, throttle quadrant has a fourth red knob. The caravan, the Cessna 208 caravan, has this fourth red knob to the left of the power lever, and that is the emergency power lever. I think it's labeled emergency power on the, um, on the caravan throttle quadrant. And what the red lever does is, in case the fuel control unit fails, it provides a backup path for the fuel with manual control via this red fourth lever on the caravan to go into the fuel system bypassing the fuel control unit in case it is enough and with this red lever you control the amount of fuel that is injected directly there's no governor in between so you have to be extremely careful in case of the failed fuel control unit to not over tempt the engine by just dumping lots of fuel into it with the um, with the red lever um, because when you ask the fuel control unit for a high gas generator RPM, it'll um, transition through this mixture curve, like avoiding the super rich areas um, because it knows how fast the engine is spinning right now and how much fuel it can inject there. Um, you take, if you take the fuel control unit out of the equation by using the emergency power lever, there's no protection as to where you're going to be on the mixture curve. So it is possible to dump in a lot of fuel while the engine is spinning very slowly and then you end up here in, in the smoke zone 
or in case of the, um, uh, the, the, the PG6 turbine, you would end up with an extremely high off-limits EGT. So that is the story behind this fourth red knob on the caravan um, throttle quadrant. All right, that explains the operation of the turboprop engine, the free turboprop engine to the pilot. There's one part of this diagram we haven't really talked about, and that is um, this funny bit down here. If you look at a PT6 engine, a free turboprop engine on an airplane, you will notice the intake underneath the propeller like so, and then to the sides of the engine, like right behind the propeller, the exhaust going out. And the PT6 engine is a reverse flow type engine, reverse flow because the air goes to the back of the engine first and then as it enters the engine and goes through the combustion process, it flows in the opposite direction to where the airplane is going. That's where the reverse flow comes from. All right, and as we take in the air underneath the engine and then we bend the airflow around to come into the engine from the back side, um, we, are, we have created an opportunity to kind of filter the air from uh, contaminants like uh, ice or any kind of uh, debris we pick up. And the way that works is as the air comes around this bent duct, um, everything that is heavy um, by means of inertia tries to be on the outside of the duct and the air which is lighter or less dense than the debris or the ice um, follows the curve of the duct. So we have an exit of the duct, a little exit here, um, where stuff that does not follow the curve easily, like ice crystals and sand and dust we pick up, can exit here and um, be ejected overboard instead of following the curve around and going into the engine. So when you switch on anti-ice on a PD-6 um, plane like the King Air, you do two things. First of all, you heat up the uh, inlet here electrically and you open the valve back here that allows the, um, the debris and ice crystals and whatnot to exit via this path. Um, anecdotally, and I have not been there, so I cannot verify this story, um, the PT-6 is so robust and does not really care for where it's getting its air from that one day a pilot took off and noticed that the engine was not quite performing as well as he was used to and the temperature was a little higher, but he made the flight kind of uneventful, noticed the high temperatures, was wondering what was going on, and as he shut down the plane and walks out and, does, and goes away from the plane, he noticed he had the plug, the cowl plug, left in here. Um, the, the intake here was fully closed and um, because the, the plug was inserted and the engine was taking all its air through um, the ice vein um, exhaust, which it was using as an intake in that case. I haven't been there, I don't know if this story is true, but knowing what I know about the PT-6, those engines are basically indestructible and run on anything. Um, yeah, I tend to believe that it is true. All right, something we haven't talked about in the diesel engine video is how you get the process started. Um, and I want to remind you, in the compression ignition versus spark ignition engine video, I explained that the compression ignition engine is basically an engine that runs in detonation all the time. And this is how it keeps the, co um, the combustion going by um, detonation. And the way to start the engine is, is speaking in um, speaking in gasoline engine terms by pre-ignition. Remember that pre-ignition in a gasoline engine means you have some hot spot in the cylinder, some kind of deposit or maybe a broken spark plug or something like that where the ceramic part is broken. Anyway, some kind of hot spot in the cylinder that ignites 
the compressing fuel air mixture before spark timing before the spark is set off to go the combustion already starts this is very destructive in a gasoline powered uh, piston engine you want to avoid this at all costs um, uh, pre-ignition is deadly and will destroy a perfectly good engine in a matter of uh, minutes um, and this is the principle on the compression ignition engine that we use to start it so when you start up a diesel engine, what you do is you create that hot spot in the cylinder on purpose by means of a glow plug. And once you have that hot spot in the cylinder, you can start the process and of um, well, compressing the air, injecting the fuel, and it starts, the process starts at the glow plug pre-ignition. Um, and this is what gets the engine going what gets the process bootstrapped once the engine is running with enough rpm the compression of just the the, the piston compressing uh, the air heats it up enough to keep the process going without the glow plug still glowing so that's what we use to start the diesel engine to bootstrap the process until the um, the rpm is sufficient for the compression to be good enough to um allow compression ignition to work and the same is true with a pt6 turboprop engine because early models of the pt6 did exactly that they use glow plugs so if you have a very old king air with an old pt6 you can recognize the different sound when you start the engine the modern king air goes when it's starting um, those are the um the igniters the igniter plugs and an old King Air will not do this. You will not hear this sound because the old model use glow plug just like a diesel engine. So the way you start the old engine is you um, uh, flip the start switch, you wait for the ignition light to come on. The ignition light means that the glow plug is heating up. Then you count to three or four to wait for the glow plug to become really hot and then you introduce the fuel. And that's how the process is started. And once the compression is good enough because the RPM is high enough and the, that the engine runs self-sustained, then you don't need the glow block anymore. And if this is switched off, it cools down and um, the process is self-sustained. And so in that way, the old PT6 engines worked exactly like a diesel engine down to the detail to how you start it. And um, in modern PT6s, which you can recognize by the ch -ch -ch sound when they start, um, the glow plug has been replaced with an igniter that basically works like the spark plug in a gasoline engine. All right, um, I'm not going to go into detail about the fixed turbo prop now because the chemical and the physical principles are the same, just the engineering part is different. But the whole idea of compression ignition, the diffusion flame, the starting process, the mixture control to control the, uh, the RPM, this is all the same. So the lower part of the whiteboard is reserved for a future video. Thank you.